This is the sixth part of my sculpture synopsis series. It's on medieval art. As with the other posts in the series, we will cover characteristic examples, the date, the location, dominant ideas, media, subject, style, major innovations in this period, big names in art, where to see the originals, and then some further reading. So we start with characteristic examples of medieval sculpture. On the left is a Visigothic eagle fibula. That means it's a sort of safety pin. It dates to the 6th century. The center is the back cover of the Lindau Gospels. Dates to circa 825. That is gold with gems. And on the right is the Portico de Gloria from the Santiago de Compostela Cathedral in Spain. Dates to 1168 to 1211. And we actually have a name attached to this one, Master Mateo. Two more characteristic examples, because it is a thousand years. On the left is the South Portal from Chartres Cathedral, which is 13th century. And on the right is a Madonna and Child sculpture that dates to circa 1340 to 1350. Moving on to dates. The Middle Ages runs from the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, 476, to 1420 or so. Although the driving forces remain the same throughout the period, see dominant ideas below, there are significant changes in art over the course of the millennium. The usual art historical divisions for the Middle Ages are as follows. There is early medieval, also known as the Dark Ages or Late Antiquity, about 476 to 780. Characteristics of the art of this period are highly stylized animal forms. This period was dubbed the Dark Ages in the 1330s by the Italian scholar Petrarch, who considered the centuries between the fall of Rome and his own period to be a period of unrelieved gloom. After the Dark Ages comes the Carolingian period, around 780 to 900, which is named because it's the rule of Charlemagne, who is also known as Carolus Magnus or Charles the Great. Art was produced at his court and at the monasteries of his empire, the Frankish Empire, which comprised much of Western Europe. We'll see that in a minute. The characteristics of this period are a revival of interest in Greek and Roman art, but it is copied without any understanding of anatomy, three-dimensional space, and so on. The result is a style that merges the northern love of ornamental detail, which we see in this fibula, with remnants of classical Greek and Roman art. The period is sometimes called the Carolingian Renaissance. Ottonian art from around 900 to 1000 is very similar, but it occurs mostly in German-speaking territories, the western part of Charlemagne's former empire. Following that is the Romanesque period, around 1000 to 1200, this is the first medieval style that spreads across all of Europe, from Sicily up to Scandinavia. It is named for the architecture's similarity to Roman architecture, with round arches and barrel vaults. This is basically a more lively version of Carolingian and Ottonian. This is the example from Santiago de Compostela. And finally, the Gothic period runs from circa 1200 to 1420. The cathedrals that rose under the newly powerful French monarchs, Louis VI and later, were the most visible symbols of France's unity. These cathedrals were covered with sculptural decoration, such as this piece from Chartres. The name for this period comes from the artists of the Italian Renaissance, who thought medieval works were barbarian, and therefore named them Gothic, after the barbarian Goths who had invaded the Roman Empire. Note that all the dates that I've given above are approximate, Travel and communication were excruciatingly slow throughout this period, so styles were slow to spread and slow to dissipate. Adding to the confusion, art historians fight to include certain works in their periods. For example, the painter Giotto, who died in 1337, is sometimes classified as a medieval artist and sometimes as a precursor of the Renaissance. Moving on to location. In the 4th and 5th centuries, the Roman Empire disintegrated into smaller states, often mere fiefdoms, that over the centuries merged and split and merged again. Medieval art is found throughout these European states. Here is a snapshot of Europe at the death of Charlemagne in 814 on the left, and on the right is Europe in 1328. You can see how much things change. 
Moving on to dominant ideas. First of all, Christianity and the next world are important. In this world, those who rule are important. As a result, cultural life is concentrated at churches, monasteries, and royal courts. The other 99.995% of the population are peasants, and they don't count. Also, men in this world are miserable and transient, and they are not worthy of study. A very different attitude from the Greeks. Moving on to media. In the early centuries of the Middle Ages, works were almost always small, so that they could be carried away, or buried, when invaders were on the way. Often the materials were very expensive things like ivory and gold and jewels. In the age of the great cathedrals, which begins around 1000 AD, there are many works attached to walls and columns, and these are made out of stone. The art of casting large bronzes, as the Greeks and Romans did, is completely lost. Subjects. Medieval art shows biblical stories to teach Christian doctrine and virtues to people who are largely illiterate, so it is didactic art. The same religious stories with the same figures and the same compositions are repeated over and over, because you want it to be easy to understand. Moving on to style. In many ways, medieval art is a continuation of late Roman art. There is no direct observation of nature. There's no attempt to show three-dimensional space. Most works are copies of earlier medieval works or of works from the Byzantine Empire, the former Roman Empire in the East. There's a strong tendency to reduce details to patterns, for example, contrapposto developed by the Greeks to show the weight shift in the human body is reduced to an S-curve, as in this figure on the right. Drapery also will tend to be reduced to regular patterns, like the folds on her sleeves and over her knees and between her legs. Innovations in this period. Not only are there no innovations, but most of what the Greeks and Romans had learned was forgotten. Big names in art. I'll give you two. There are not many, really. First is Klaus Sluter, who died in 1405-1406. He was the greatest sculptor of his time in Northern Europe. He worked for Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, which is now Eastern France. Sluter's work is part of the transition from the stiffness and repetitiveness of late medieval sculpture to a more naturalistic, realistic style. His most important works are in Dijon, and they date to around 1395 to 1403. The two images on the right are works by Lorenzo Ghiberti, who died in 1455. He was a sculptor and goldsmith, and he is famous for two sets of gilded doors on the baptistry in Florence that date to 1403 to 24 and 1425 to 52. Although Ghiberti shows some Renaissance influence, he's fundamentally a late medieval sculptor working in the international Gothic style. Where would you go to see the originals of medieval sculpture? Well, primarily to the cathedrals of Europe, including Chartres, Rheims, Vézelay, Notre Dame de Paris, Cologne, Santiago de Compostela. If you just Google Gothic churches Europe, you'll come up with maps of where they are. In the U.S., the best place to see medieval art would be the cloisters at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. For further reading, I'm giving you a random list of books that I remember vividly. William Manchester, A World Lit Only by Fire. This is the only nonfiction one on the list. Ken Follett's The Pillars of the Earth is a fictional story about the building of a great cathedral. Walter Scott's Ivanhoe is one of the earliest works of historical fiction. It's set in medieval England. Sigrid Unset wrote the Christian Lavransdatter trilogy, which is set in 14th century Norway. Umberto Eco wrote The Name of the Rose. You may know it better from the movie. It's about a monk who solves a series of murders in Italy in 1347. Dorothy Dunnett's King Hereafter is a fascinating retelling of the Macbeth story, set in the period circa 1020 to 1057. I'm really very fond of Dorothy Dunnett. And Alice Peters wrote the Brother Cadfell mysteries, which are set in England 1135 to 1145. For more on the why and the how of the sculpture synopsis, see the first post in this series. The series is also available as a playlist on my YouTube channel. DianeDurantiWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantiWriter.com. 
As always, thank you for listening.